Oops. Okay. I think I was on mute. Okay. I think it's fixed now. Let me know. What's that? Yeah, but I've unmuted it on here, so it should be working. I'm actually using two different computers here as backup. Actually, I wish now I could. Uh... Can you hear me now? <laughs> It always happens near the beginning of the semester. I make a mistake like this, but okay, you can hear me now. Great, thank you. So I'm sorry for everything you missed. Um, I don't know if I can summarize it in a couple words, but but we'll we'll be talking about this more. I was just introducing the things that we're going to keep on talking about. So these are the these are the two clinics, a thousand people. They're different, coming from different populations. That is, one is the a population of people who already think that that maybe they have the chlamydia infection, and so they're going into the STD clinic on the left, and then another population that is going to into the clinic for other reasons, and the prevalence is only 3% instead of 30%. So, so let's see. Um, so in the 30%, in the 30% prevalence clinic, we're writing in the margins here the numbers of patients who are negative and positive, so that 30% are positive. Does anyone remember the, I think I gave you a name for those, those probabilities that you write down in the margins? Yeah, the marginal probabilities, yeah. So, so these are um, one divided by 1,000. These are the marginal probabilities of, of being chlamydia positive and negative among people going into the STD clinic. Now, we're, they, we're, we're assuming that this test, or we have information um, from this test, um, that it has a certain um, sensitivity and specificity. That is, um, a certain accuracy on the positive cases and on the negative cases. So among these, these 300 here, this test is correct on 294. I forget what that, what is 294 out of 300. That's, I think, 98%. So that means that, that if you are chlamydia positive, it has a 98% chance of returning a positive te test. And that is the sensitivity. So it's quite a it's quite a sensitive test. Um, if you have chlamydia, it's very likely to return a positive test. And then on the negative cases, it's correct on 679 out of out of 700. And that is let's see, 96 uh, percent I think. And that's the specificity. So we've got 98% sensitivity, that's its performance on the positive cases, and 96% specificity, that's the performance on the negative cases, the accuracy on the negative cases. So once we've got this, this table here filled out, well, all we've used, we've used a hypothetical population, we've used the sensitivity and specificity, um, and, and the prevalence in order to fill this table out. Then we can go ahead and calculate these marginal probabilities along the rows. And how, what do, what do these probabilities mean? So 
this this um, 315 divided by um, sorry 315 is um, the sum of this row 294 divided by that does someone want to put that into words for me what is that what, what would 294 out of 315 how would you interpret that probability yes That's right. So it's the probability. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, that's the probability that, given a positive test, that you actually have the disease. And, and do you remember what I defined that as being earlier in the class? The positive predictive value, exactly. So. That is the thing that, that um, as a patient going into the clinic, um, is, is what you should either be worried or not based on. Um, and, this, and in this case, the positive predictive value is, is pretty high. Uh, I calculated it here at point, point 0.93. And the negative predictive value, 679 over 685, is even better, 0.99. So that's the probability that if you test negative, you don't have, have the disease. So did you notice that even though the specificity wasn't quite as good as the sensitivity, right? It was 96% specificity and 98% sensitivity. So the performance wasn't quite as good on the negative cases, but the negative predictive value is much better. Does anyone know why why that is? So that's the that's the probability given a negative test that you don't have the disease. Does anyone want to hazard a guess as to why um, why the net negative predictive value is so much better here? Because it's six hundred seventy nine over. That's the value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mathematically that's why, but but intuitively, yeah. So I would say it's technically sensitive enough. So that you're more likely to get a negative predictive value because you have more So it's because the test isn't quite sensitive enough. Um that's that's a that's a correct I mean it depends on, on how good a positive predictive value you, you want. I mean, that's correct. It's not good enough to give you that, like a really high positive predictive value. Um, another way you could think about it intuitively is that going into the clinic, you have a 70% chance of not having a disease. So even just you know, a, a random test is going to be more accurate on the, the negative pop if you just take a, an even guess between yes or no, um, you'll do better on the, the no disease population because that's more likely to be the truth. Yes? So is the prevalence were 50% if the prevalence were 50% and the sensitivity and specificity were the same, then yes. I'd expect them to be the same. Good, good point. So on the right here, we take exactly the same test and apply it to the private practice where the prevalence is 3%. So same test, different population. Um, filling out the boxes here looks uh, really different. So the positive, negative, we only have 30 true positives and 970 true negatives. So of course we have few, the, the PCR tests turning positives for fewer people um, and negatives for more people. But when we go down and look at this, this positive predictive value and negative predictive value, it looks pretty different. The, the positive predictive value is now kind of miserable. 
um, it's still a useful test and that, that if with the positive test, you've gone from a 3% chance of having the infection to a 50% chance of the infection, but it's still just, just even odds. So wrap your mind around that for a second, that it's the exact same test, but it's performing differently in this other population. <clears throat> so I want to give me a nice intuitive explanation of how that can be. I like to hear these in other people's words because I get stuck in my own ways of explaining them, but yes. Could you speak speak up a little? Okay. Um, so maybe because there's so little chance catching them here. Mm-hmm. Because there's so little chance of actually having chlamydia. Yeah. So there's often going to be mistakes because you're applying it to so many people who don't have the disease. I think that's a pretty good explanation. Yeah. Any, any more? Yep. Can you speak up a bit? Mm -hmm. If there are no positives. Yeah, so. It, Yeah, so taken to the extreme of a population where there are no true positives, then all you see are false positives. So in that population with no true positives, your positive predictive value is going to become zero. Your probability of having chlamydia just because you've received a positive test is still zero because you're in a population where it doesn't exist. But you still have those false positives because the test is not perfect. So that's also a good a good way to think of it. Does anyone else still have something different to say? Yeah? Sorry, could you speak up a bit? In the first case, we have specifically a study clinic, so there are like no chances of having this positive level, and this entire fact is usually they don't like There are no positive things for these things. Yeah, so, th so you're thinking of it in the other way, where you have lots of true positives, um, you're, you're, you're more likely to observe a correct positive result because you have lots. So actually you could think of that also, you take it to the extreme of a population where everyone has chlamydia, then your positive predictive value is 100% because, because, well, regardless of the test outcome, but with positive predictive value, we're only thinking about the positive tests, your probability of having chlamydia given you have a positive test is 100%. Did you have another comment? No, it was pretty much the same thing. Okay. I, mean, I believe that uh, on the STD clinic, they're testing it, right? Uh, in practice, they may be testing those with symptomatic patients, which means they don't have a relationship. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the prevalence is lower in the private practice. They're asymptomatic patients, so I kind of like I kind of like this explanation of just thinking of it, taking it to the extremes of the population with a zero prevalence and a hundred percent prevalence. Obviously, you're going to have a different result for positive predictive value and negative predictive value. And you and by going to those extremes, you can think about what the effect um, of prevalence is on PPV and on NPV. And you can think about which matters, the sensitivity or the specificity. In the 100% prevalence case, obviously all that matters is your sensitivity. In the 0% prevalence case, what matters is your specificity, right? Your performance on the negative cases. So these, these actually are the kinds of questions, I don't know, I tried to, like, on the exam, get 
bring out the intuitive understanding of things and not just do calculations. So being able to think through, uh, think through these things to me is the most important thing and, and will help you in reading about results relating to screening tests. Yes. Right. So just the question was just to repeat um, what I had said that going to the extremes of 0% prevalence and 100% prevalence are useful for thinking about things like the fact that in a 0% prevalence case, you have only true negatives. So it's only the test performance on true negatives that matters. And performance accuracy on true negatives is the specificity. So you need to, so, and, and in the 100% prevalence case, all true positives, what matters is only your, your sensitivity. All right, so we've got our examples. And again, that, that previous example, there's a whole article discussing it uh, posted, posted with the lecture. So some definitions. An event is your single measurable definite outcome. For example, the individual has the chlamydia infection, yes or no. So that is, um, that's the gold, the gold standard event. Either the person has or has not, and there isn't uncertainty in that. Uh, for example, individual survives past 70 years of age, yes or no. Um, and of course, we only know that once they are either older than 70 or they have died. Um, an infant survives the first year of life. Again, we only know that if they're more than a year old or, or they have died. So it's, it's um, something that has a hard outcome, a definite event. And probability, there's, there are a number of different interpretations of probability. The frequentist one that I'm used to is the rate of an event for a very large number of observations. So if you look at a thousand or a million people, the probability of a person in that, that large sample or that population of, of, of having chlamydia, the probability of them surviving past 70 years or past the first year. So the distinction between events and probability is the event you know the truth, probability, that's just, it's a hypothetical thing, or it's something where you don't know the answer yet. Sensitivity and specificity, we've been talking about them, but here they are uh, written down. These are the intrinsic properties of a test. Sensitivity being the probability of a positive test for individuals with the disease. So applied to the 100% to the prevalence population, it is the probability of getting a positive test, the fraction of positive tests in that population. And conversely, specificity is the probability of a negative test for the individuals without the disease. So the 0% prevalence population. Here's one more example, type 2 uh, diabetes mellitus, um, which is, is highly prevalent in the elderly U.S. population. The gold standard diagnosis uh, requires this oral glucose tolerance test, which requires fasting, drinking a glucose solution, then drawing blood uh, at intervals to measure uh, the glucose and how it uh, falls off with time. So it requires a long period of time, it's expensive, and it requires uh, blood drawing. However, there's a screening test which is um, requires just the fast and a measurement of the amount of glucose in there, uh, in, in the plasma, in the blood. So that's sort of based on the assumption that everybody has a kind of similar amount of, um, of 
glucose until they start fasting. And then if you're able to properly metabolize it, it goes down. And if you are not, you're diabetic, it remains high. So it's, it's not as accurate because you're not spiking in this glucose solution. And you're also not going at intervals to observe the trend over time. So it's much faster, it's much easier, but it's more prone to the individual var variability of the amount of glucose people individuals naturally have in their blood. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm giving this example uh, is because there's a nice other set of lecture slides, which I've borrowed some and also uh, from some and also posted in the um, uh, Blackboard under today's lecture. So let's take this example. Um, and here's a kind of a hypothetical scatter plot. This is more like a dot plot um, separated into two boxes of what blood sugar looks like after some period of fasting among diabetics and non-diabetics. And, and so what we see here among diabetics, um, there tend to be more with high blood sugar and among non-diabetics there are more with less blood sugar, but there's quite a bit of overlap between them. Um, so this is kind of a good cartoon example of, of all of the concepts we're talking about. So we're clearly getting some information from this test because the diabetics have a tendency to have higher blood sugar after the period of fasting than the non-diabetics, but it's not perfect because some non-diabetics um, have high blood sugar to begin with, and some diabetics have uh, low blood sugar to begin with, and there's overlap between them. So this is, say, a test among 20 diabetics and non-diabetics where, um, where we have the gold standard truth for them, and then we're applying this test to them. So, oops. So we get a continuous measure here of blood sugar level, but we want to make a call about whether someone is suspect of diabetes or not. And so there are different strategies you could take, but you need to set a threshold. So here is an example of setting a low threshold. So we're gonna say um, everyone above this threshold, we're gonna say they're diabetic. So this would be a high what test by setting the threshold low? Yeah, it's a high sensitivity test. So among the diabetics, we're getting 17 out of 20 of them for a sensitivity of 85%. But the drawback to setting that low threshold is that we don't do as well on specificity. So we're doing well on the diabetics, we're doing badly on the non-diabetics, which is the, the specificity. So among the non-diabetics, we've got um, six correct tests and 14 incorrect tests for a specificity of 30%. Now you could take a different approach here and set a higher threshold on on whether we say someone is a diabetic. And by setting a higher threshold, we're gonna get a lower sensitivity, right? Is that making, is that making sense? So now, among this diabetics population, we're doing pretty badly. We only caught five out of 20 of them for a sensitivity of 25% but we're doing better among the non-diabetics. We got that right for 18 out of 20 for a specificity of, of 90%. So that, that is the sensitivity specificity trade-off in, in screening tests, in that for a given test, you have to choose your level of sensitivity and specificity. Um, but you can't improve both without getting a better test. 
but you can make that trade off. Now, in a typical population, so this was not really a population, this was a trial where we had 20 people where the answer was known. Um, but in, once we go and apply this uh, to a new set of potential diabetics, um, there's of course no line separating them. We don't know who the diabetics are. And in fact, there's no labels either. All we have is 40 people. But we're going to take that cut point that was determined sometime a while ago in a test and, and apply it to these. And whoever comes in above that line is going to get called a diabetic. That is the, the results of this test. And everyone below the line will get called non-diabetic. Um, and that, of course, affects the number of, of patients you identify. And where that line gets set is going to depend on the relative costs of making mistakes on the positive cases versus on the negative cases. And it's a point of great debate for almost any kind of screening test. So summing up sensitivity and specificity, setting different cut points, um, changes your trade-off between sensitivity and specificity. Uh, one thing that I didn't cover in here but you might see is called the receiver operating characteristic or ROC plot, ROC, um, and that plots um, sensitivity versus one minus specificity for the entire range of possible cut points. Um, I don't know if I can The rock plot looks something like this. It has an identity line drawn. This would normally be, um, well, it would normally be called true positives, the true positive rate, and one minus the false positive rate. So at the, uh, let's see, at the very low threshold, um, you, you call everything, you, you say that everyone has you say that everyone has the disease, you have a very high false positive rate um, and a low true positive rate. So that's down here. If you have a random test, it would track that identity line and the better your test, the more it, the more it goes away from it with your ideal test having an area here of one. And that area under the curve is a, is a measure of the quality of your test averaged across all of the possible thresholds. You don't need to know that. That's just uh, something that you might come across the ROC plot. All right. So. PPV and NPV, those are properties of the test applied to the population. And here are their definitions, PPV being the probability that someone with a positive test in fact does have the disease, and NPV being the probability that someone with a negative test in fact does not have the disease. So those are qualities of the test applied to a certain prevalence, a population with some certain prevalence. Um, we can go back to that example and calculate the PPV NPV. This is a bit of an artificial example though, because that was an artificial population, one with 20 diabetics and 20 non-diabetics. That's not a real population. Um, so although you can calculate the PPV and NPV here, um, this is actually, 
I think an example of a misleading calculation that I have often seen in publications and I have had to argue with my clinical co collaborators against reporting. Um, because when we calculate the PPV here, this five out of seven, this isn't a real population. It doesn't really mean anything, this PPV calculation, because presumably this test is, the next step is to go and apply apply it in a in a some test population which probably has a lower prevalence than 50 percent and so to say to someone that they should expect a ppv of five sevenths is misleading because if you apply it to a lower prevalence population what's going to happen to the ppv it's going to be lower yeah, so unless you, unless you apply it to a population where the prevalence of diabetes is 50%, you're going to have a lower PPV than, than you see here. So I think it's misleading to use an artificial population like this to report your PPV. It just shouldn't be reported at all, in my opinion. What should be reported is the PPV you expect in a given prevalence population, and that's something that you're going to learn to calculate using Bayes' rule. Um, PPV, as I mentioned, causes a lot of debate um, because useful tests um, being applied in a very low prevalence population produce a lot of false positives. And the cost of those false, false positives can sometimes be high. You know, it can result in unnecessary surgeries, stress, um, and a mental health screening program. It could have other types of uh, impacts on people's lives. Um, you know, these, these are our mistakes that are made. People who, in fact, have no treatable condition um, who need no treatment being told that they need treatment. Um, you know, of course, the screening test is usually meant to be step one in a couple of steps that, that ends in some much more accurate, much more accurate test. Um, but, but regardless, the, there can be costs to these false um, to these false positives and I think part of the, the reason for these controversies is around the relative cost of those false positives versus the cost of a false negative and it also has to do in some cases with with just a lack of understanding of what it means to apply a, a screening test to a very low prevalence population um, and this is why some of these tests like the the PS the PSA test, the mammography, um, one of the reasons why they're recommended only for older populations because it's a higher prevalence population. Um, in some cases, it's also a more effective test um, intrinsically among them, but it is certainly a, a higher prevalence population and a test that, that provides too many false positives in the very low prevalence positive can have a better trade-off uh, in the higher prevalence population. So I want to explain Bayes' rule to you now, uh, but to get there, I need to introduce some probability notation. So we've got um, A and B being two different events, uh, and A union B means that either one has happened. The intersection, the upside down U, uh, means both of them have occurred. The complement is, is not A, it's just 1 minus uh, the probability if we're talking about probabilities. And this vertical bar here, this is a conditional probability. So prob you would read this bottom line here as the probability of A given B, or the probability of A occurring conditionally on B already having occurred. And you can draw these as Venn diagrams. Um, Venn diagrams are used, you, you put in frequencies or probabilities where um, 
A and B here, or A, B, and C. These are different, um, uh, different events with the overlap of them being the intersection, the union being uh, all of the area encompassed by, by both of them. Yes? Sorry, concerning what? Yes. A question concerning a conditional. Okay, so the question is, does the, the order matter in conditional probability? Um, the answer is yes, the order matters. You can have the probability, you can calculate the probability of A conditionally on B. You can calculate the probability of B conditionally on A. And in general, they're different. So the, the, the order does matter there. And in fact, the relationship between those two is, is given by Bayes' rule. As, as an example of that order mattering, I think I, I have an example coming up, but um, let's do one now. Uh, I was thinking I, I, I live up in Washington Heights and go by the George Washington Bridge regularly, and trucks are allowed only to go on the upper level, but cars can go either on the upper or the lower level. So, um, so conditional probabilities. What's the probability of being on, on the upper level given that you are driving a truck. It, it's 100%, you're not allowed on the lower level. But what's the probability of being a truck given that you're on the upper level? Depends on how many, you know, the relative amount of cars and trucks up there, but it's not the same thing. So that's, yeah, that's a, a good question and a very important point. Uh, how are we for time here? We're a little bit short on time. Um, but I guess we could go through these quickly. Let's see. So want to tell me what this first one is? How would I write this in probability notation? Probability of B, yeah. How about this one? A union B, very good. A union B. Uh, this one? Probability of A, very good. How about this one, a little trickier? Sorry? A not B. Yep, that, except that I haven't given you a not notation. So what's another way of using? Hmm? Uh, yeah, so it's A, and let's do the intersection with B complement. That works. There are other ways you could write this, but that's one using the notation we've gotten so far. I'm kind of keeping your probability notation to a, to a minimum. Uh, okay, and this one? B intersection with what? Yeah, with A complement. Good. Okay. And last one. Yeah, intersection of A and B. So A intersect with B. Or probability of B intersect with A. Doesn't matter. Same up here. It could be probability of B union A. Doesn't matter. So in those cases, the order does not matter. All right. Got it? When we have mutually exclusive events, such as um, uh, being positive for chlamydia and negative for chlamydia, then there's no overlap between, between these events. Um, so the Venn diagram would look like that. And in this case, the probability of 
chlamydia positive, then I think there might be a typo in the notes in one of these, which I caught after I had the notes printed. Um, but probability of chlamydia positive union with chlamydia negative is just the same as the sum of these two because there's no overlap. If there was an overlap, then if you just summed these two areas, you'd be double counting the region in the middle, right? So th this equation here, this is a property only for mutually exclusive events. And in this case, um, that sum is one because they're both mutually exclusive and they're exhaustive. The answer is either positive or, or negative. There isn't a third option here that could, that could add also to the probability. So first row here is a rule of, for mutually exclusive events, second one for exhaustive events. Um, and for these exhaustive events, the probability of the intersection, so of having both, is, is zero, that, which is to say that there's no overlap in the Venn diagram. For non-exclusive events, we have some overlap here. Um, so this, this union equation, it has the sum like before, but then you have to subtract off this area in the middle because it's getting counted twice when you just add probability. So this is, say, having chlamydia and having heart disease. It's possible to have both. So um, if you just sum these two probabilities, um, you get something that's a little too high for, um, for the intersection or the probability of both chlamydia and heart disease. But if you subtract off that intersection region, then you get the right, the right combined probability, the right, the right union. And the intersection, this, um, this part in the middle, is equal to the product of these two probabilities if they are independent events. So if it's like a coin flip where your probability of having one has no relation to the other, then you can just multiply to get this, this intersection. So conditional probability, the probability of, of A given B um, is given by this equation. And maybe it's actually a little bit easier to, um, to think of it in terms of, remember that intersection, that that probability in the middle here, um, it's, it's the probability of, of A given that, that B has occurred times the probability of B occurring. So, <coughs> um, pardon me. So, um, this, pro this conditional probability is counted only among times where this event B has already occurred. So all of the cases where B does not occur everywhere outside here, this probability of it, it doesn't contribute in any way to this conditional probability. Only this overall probability of, of B. Now, that leads directly to, to Bayes' rule. Um, and this is just a very brief, brief proof of Bayes' rule or Bayes' theorem. It's, I think, the only proof that I'm going to give you this uh, semester. But I couldn't resist just because it's, it's actually a fairly... Um, it's something very short. And all it comes from is this property of transitivity, that the probability of A intersected with B is the same as probability of B intersected with A. And then you go and write out that equation from the previous page in both of these ways, 
and then divide through by this probability of d, and there is Bayes' rule for you. So it's it's like a really basic property of, of probability, Bayes' rule. Uh, but it's so widely used in, in probability and statistics that each of these terms has a name. We've got Actually, let's start on the right here. This probability of A is called a prior probability. Um, and in the context of, uh, of a screening test, that's the prevalence. That is, you know, before any additional information, that is your probability of having the condition. So it's the prior probability. Then this probability of B given, given A, that's the likelihood. Um, in statistics, it's called the likelihood. Um, we have also been calling that uh, the, the, well, it's called the likelihood because it's applied to many things that, besides um, screening tests. But in the context of a screening test where, where A is the truth of having the, the disease and B is the outcome of the test, then this thing on the right is the sensitivity. It's the probability of a positive test. Um, given that, that you have the disease. And then this probability of, of B is sort of just a normalizing factor. It's for the population that you're in, it's the probability of, of a positive test. And this thing on the left in our, in our context would be the positive predictive value. So what's important about this equation for us is that it relates the sensitivity of a test to the positive predictive value. And you can also use it to relate the specificity to the negative predictive value. That's why we learn it. Um, so as I mentioned, no, probability of A conditional on B is not the same as probability of B conditional on A. Um, so the George Washington Bridge, that's one example. Here's another example, yes. Okay, so the question, yeah, so the question was, if we're going to do a different test, we've used, we've used this first test to calculate a posterior probability. Would you use that posterior probability as the prior probability in your second test? Um, and the answer is, is yes, that's a very reasonable thing to do. Um, in practice, I don't know how often that is applied in the context of screening tests, um, but, uh, in terms of um, of statistical application, that is a, a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And there are um, there are statistical applications that that do that. Do a calculation um, sort of in a chain where you calculate, you use your initial prior, multiply by the likelihood to get a posterior, then use that in turn as the prior and kind of go on and keep on updating with more information as you get it to get your posterior probability. Good question. Um, anyways, another silly example. Um, I think we're gonna have to skip over these examples, but take a, take a look at them. Um, you have any uh, questions with them go ahead and post them actually we should start using our um, our our group uh, Google discussion group we can if you want you can post answers to here and uh, and make sure that uh, you're getting the same answers as, as as your classmates and I can check them as well um, there are also, just to mention some handy online tools I don't mind if you use these these Bayes theorem uh, calculators. Uh, I've also posted a, an Excel tool um, that I that I put together for calculating Bayes rule so that you can just fill in cells of an Excel spreadsheet and it'll apply Bayes rule. Um, yeah, in summary, if you've taken one thing from this class, it should be that the probability of having a disease given a positive test result is not the same as the probability of a positive test result 
given that you have the disease. That was the first example and kind of what I've been um, getting at how to calculate and relate these things through the whole class. So there's your take home message. Hopefully you'll, be, you'll also be able to do some calculations, but this is kind of the big message. Um, and just some uh, summary of all of the definitions for you, separated by properties of the test and application of the test to the population. All right, and I'll let you um, have a drink of water or whatever and reconvene in the lab downstairs. Thank you.